This morning, we are so honored to have the second of our 20-something 2018 confirmands here to do her invocation. This is Anna Cross. Let us pray. Loving God, we know that you see us and walk with us in good times and bad. We ask that you help us to remember those who mourn and help us to celebrate life every day. We honor those who have passed by remembering the love they brought to our lives. We give you thanks for the saints of the church. Amen. Good morning, would you please join me in the call to worship in the bulletin. God of the ages, your saints who lived in faithful service surround you and offer praise both day and night. May your saints on earth join their voices to theirs to proclaim your rule of righteousness and peace. We pray in communion with all those in heaven and all here on earth. Come, let all the saints worship the Lord. Join me in prayer. Holy living and still speaking God, in whom we live, breathe, and have our very being, we gather in this sanctuary, this sanctuary of safety, security, sanity, and salvation, to give you thanks, first for the gift of life, and then for the gift of eternal life. God of our parents, and grandparents and great-grandparents on infinitum, we pause to thank you for all the saints, those remembered and those forgotten. 
But especially on this All Saints Sunday, we thank you for the saints in our lives who during the last 12 months entered into your eternal glory. And we pray for those saints still living among us today, especially in our sister congregations here in Weston, worshiping at Temple Emmanuel, Temple Israel, and St. Francis. And we ask that you teach us to follow the examples of those saints who have graduated from the church militant. That's the church of the living God fighting to let the world know the love of God in Jesus Christ by reaching out to feed the hungry, comforting those who mourn, working for peace, love, and justice. Those saints have now graduated from the church militant to the church victorious, and now are with God celebrating their victory with Jesus. Precious Presence, speak to us this morning through your servant, our brother, Father Robbie Penoyer, that we might hear your word for our lives. And may we, your living saints here on earth, join our voices with the saints who've gone on to their heavenly reward to proclaim your reign of righteousness, peace, justice, and love through our Savior Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, Norfield. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Ecclesiasticus, book 44, verses 1 through 10 and 13 through 14. Let us now sing the praises of famous men, our ancestors in their generations. The Lord apportioned them to great glory, his majesty from the beginning. 
There were those who ruled in their kingdoms and made a name for themselves by their valor, those who gave counsel because they were intelligent, those who spoke in prophetic oracles, those who led the people by their counsels and by their knowledge of the people's lore. They were wise in their words of instruction. Those who composed musical tunes or put verses in writing. Rich men endowed with resources, living peacefully in their homes. All these were honored in their generations and were the pride of their times. Some of them have left behind a name so that others declare their praise. But of others, there is no memory. They have perished as though they had never existed. They have become as though they had never been born, they and their children after them. But these also were godly men whose righteous deeds have not been forgotten. Their offspring will continue forever and their glory will never be blotted out. Their bodies are buried in peace, but their name lives on generation after generation. This is the word of God. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves as he, just as he is pure. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you to Bernard and Kelly for letting me share your pulpit. Thank you to Tracy for, I think, arranging this invitation. And thank you to you all for the, your hospitality and warm welcome this morning. It's a real delight to be with you all today. Uh, last night, Tracy hosted a small group of you uh, for dinner. And usually, the routine is you have to sing for your supper. Um, but supper was delicious and eaten, so uh, we'll see if the spirit says sing. Uh, and uh, will, will you pray with me that it does? Help us, Lord, to become masters of ourselves, that we might become the servants of others. Take our hands and work through them. Take our mouths and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire for Christ's sake. Amen. At some point along the bumpy road to adulthood, I came to the unpleasant realization that try as I might, I would never play second base for the New York Yankees. <laughs> Nor would I ever be an Oscar-winning movie star, a celebrated composer, a Pulitzer Prize-winning poet, a record-setting set juggler, or the Pope. Uh, until recently, I would have included on that list the realization that I would never become President of the United States, but that, that bar seems in flux. So who knows? <laughs> Some of them have left behind a name, the author of Ecclesiasticus tells us, so that others declare their praise. But of others, there is no memory. They have perished as though they had never existed. Among the life lessons that nudge adolescents into adulthood is the realization that we are all perishable goods. We learn to give up the expectation that we'll achieve immortality, that we'll become ball players and big shots whose names will live forever. And it's a good thing when we do, for getting over a childish thirst for fame is surely a prerequisite for getting on with a difficult business of living a good life. The Reverend Professor Peter J. Gomes took special delight in helping Harvard students confront the reality that they were destined for anonymity. I know we're in Yale country, but I suspect Gomes was known to some of you. For decades, he was the closest thing Harvard had to a chaplain, and while I was an undergraduate there, he was the closest thing I had to a mentor. He described himself as an Afro-Saxon, 
a short, fat, black, gay, Republican, Baptist preacher with high Anglican tendencies, a punch bowl of contradictions. Now, Harvard freshmen, like Harvard graduates, can be particularly insufferable, although it's not always through their own fault. They spend this week of orientation being told over and over again how extraordinary they are. They hear the names of luminaries who have walked the halls before them, the Roosevelts, Kennedys, Emerson, Thoreau, Helen Keller, Yo-Yo Ma, and they quickly start envisioning the accomplishments that will launch them into that crimson pantheon. Gomes relished puncturing their inflated egos, just as he punctured mine. And I remember the sermon in which he did it. It was Freshman Sunday. Gazing out over the pulpit of the Memorial Church, he addressed my classmates and me, telling us in his inimitable voice that I will nonetheless try to imitate. You are the class of 2005. And before you know it, you will all graduate. And I know that you anticipate becoming CEOs and senators, billionaires and big wigs, all of you. Don't deny it. And we laughed uncomfortably at that wagging finger and also at the realization that he was telling the truth. <laughs> but I have bad news for you. You are not Harvard's first class of 05. There was the class of 1905 and the class of 1805, and the class of 1705. And I have searched the rosters of those classes, and there is not a single memorable name among them. <laughs> we laughed again, but much more nervously as he made his point. Class of 2005, you must face up to the facts. You are doomed to live normal lives. <laughs> so for God's sake, live them well, by which I mean do some good. What does it mean in this world so obsessed with doing well for us to focus instead on doing good? I think that's an All Saints Day sort of question. We are gathered here this morning to praise God and to give thanks for the gifts of the saints, for those men and women whose lives of holiness make visible the love of God. They who make Christ credible even, tangible, for those in whose midst they lived. They who form today the great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us still. They who join our feeble voices in prayer so that the body of Christ might stretch beyond this realm of the living and into the company of heaven. Some of them have left behind a name so that others declare their praise, to quote Ecclesiasticus again. But of others, there is no memory. They have perished as though they had never existed. There are saints whose lives and stories are well known, heroes of the faith whose stern visages peer down from some congreg at some congregations through stained glass, there are saints whose feast days we mark and whose stories we tell to children in hopes that the courage and faith of the saints may alight in their imaginations and plant in their hearts an ambition for goodness that can keep pace with their ambition for greatness. <clears throat> but today we celebrate forgotten saints too. We sang the hymn tune Sine Nomine this morning. Sine Nomine, without a name. For when we sing for all the saints, we sing too for those saints whose names and stories have perished from history's memory, as our own names and stories will surely do too. And so today we ensure that anonymity is not mistaken for unimportance. For the lives and love of these unnamed saints continue to ripple through the church and the world. Far from being a sign of unimportance, the anonymity of these saints testifies to their self-effacing, to their, their Christ-like love. So thoroughly must they have subsumed their pride in service of their Lord and their neighbor that they seem to have loved themselves into oblivion. All right, going to sing when the Spirit says sing. We sing for all the unsung saints 
that countless nameless throng who kept the faith and passed it on with hope steadfast and strong. Through all the daily griefs and joys, no chronicles record, forgetful of their lack of fame, but mindful of their Lord. What does it mean for us to focus on doing good in a world obsessed with doing well? The lives of the unsung saints can offer us a clue. But so too can our own grief coax from us the beginnings of an answer to that All Saints Day question. Today and all around Christendom, congregations will list the names of the faithful departed whose lives were closely linked with ours and whose absence we still feel sorely. Grief is an odd and effective teacher. The suddenness of any loss and the sharpness of our pain can scorch away the cloudy complacency that blinds us daily to the preciousness of life. When a good life ends, the memories that survive its death, the memories we carry of those we've loved, they undergo a scorching too, a refinement of their own. The stories we tell, the anecdotes we share, the details that fix themselves in our minds are all so relatively few and finite that we return to them again and again. For a loss can feel so vast that love attaches to the tiniest remembrance of the slightest gesture, a significance that only death could teach us to see. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. That is what we are, the epistle tells us, children of God. But just as the world failed to recognize God in human form, so do we fail to know ourselves. Our senses are dull to the preciousness of our own lives, and we are strangers to ourselves, uncertain of our capacity for goodness, for mercy, for compassion, for courage, for faith, uncertain because we've never fully stretched their limits or tested them. But there's hope, for the epistle tells us what we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. The Gospels tell us that the risen Lord was often mistaken for an ordinary man, even by those who knew him best. Failing to recognize his scars and his smile, they thought he was the gardener, or a stranger grilling some fish, or a, a fellow traveler along the dusty road to Emmaus. And when they eventually recognized him, they, they couldn't hold on to him, but they knew his love and felt afresh theirs for him. It attached itself to the stories they told about him, that patchwork of spotty remembrances whose significance they'd only become, begun to grasp. If God during his time on earth was so easily mistaken for an ordinary man, perhaps it's not unthinkable that we might bear a passing resemblance to God, who after all is said to have, been cre who to have created us in God's image. The word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, did through his transcendent love become what we are, that he might bring us to become even what he is himself. So said the second century saint and theologian Irenaeus. Those whom we celebrate as saints recognize the preciousness of life, recognized what it means to be beloved as a child of God. Forgoing greatness, they pursued goodness. And by the grace of God, they showed for us a way to do the same. All right, the Spirit sang, sing again. Let's see if I can find this old hymn. It's by Carl Daw, contemporary hymn writer. So we take heart from unknown saints bereft of earthly fame. Those faithful ones who have received a more enduring name. For they reveal true blessing comes when we our pride efface 
and offer back our lives to be the vessels of God's grace. And so this morning, let us give thanks to all the saints in our midst and in the company of heaven, those whose stories we know and those whose names we never will. May God give us the grace to know their presence and to follow their example, that we may pass on with selfless hope and great delight the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom, O Lord, with thee and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen.